Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very special edition of Rico Brony. It's the beginning of a brand new series, the Killer Series, where we talk to people throughout Met history that killed us, that gave us great suffering. And I think this is the right guy to open this series up with. A man who with one pitch, and it was really more than one pitch, caused us great pain and anguish and has really sent us as Met fans into a long period of despair. So, before we get started, I just want to say on behalf of every single Met fan out there, on behalf of all of the people that were at Shea Stadium on that October night, on behalf of every Met fan that's watched this man pitch, let me just tell Adam Wainwright, can you go fuck yourself? <laughs> wow. Well, you weren't kidding. You were. You came in hot. Um, well, you know, out of respect for you and your podcast and what a great job y'all do, uh, or what I thought you did. Um <laughs> I thought you were gonna, uh, you know, be gentle, so I, I didn't. I didn't face the camera towards that. Oh, you son! Of a, I see what you're doing. I see what you're showing. Yeah, I yeah, see. All see that. that? That's the 06 World Series Championship celebration. So I just didn't know if you could see it. Can you see yeah. it? Yeah. Oh no, I, I see it. Yeah, no, I see it's it. It's right I mean, there. No, it's just very pretty. It's very very yeah, nice. That's me right there. I'm celebrating. <laughs> oh, I see it. All right. Let me ask you this. Because I think to to me, to many Met fans, like whenever we talk about worst moments as fans, that's a game that comes up. That's a moment that comes up. And I'm just curious for you, because with all due respect, you've had a hell of a career and you accomplished a lot. This was early in your career. This was you as a young pitcher closing because of an injury. Is this like a very special moment to you? Is it almost equal in love to the pain we suffer from it, striking out Beltran the way you did? Let, let me tell you this. Um, the best chirp and biggest compliment at the same time I ever received from a fan from the stands was at City Field last year. And it was one of those movie-type moments where, you know, everyone's chirping and hollering and whatever. But then it just kind of like went silent all of a sudden. And there was this one particular guy, and I hope he's listening to this so he feels special too. <laughs> he goes, Wainwright, you ruined my life in the sixth grade. <laughs> and I was like, yes. I love that. I love that I ruined his life in the sixth grade. I, I uh, you know, I, and I loved hearing the booze coming back. But you know, it was, you know, it was great about, uh, the Mets fans, they were all like, Wainwright, we freaking hate your guts. But you, you know, respect, you did pretty good. You did good. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I mean, you did all right. You know, it's funny. I want to go back to the very beginning because you're drafted by the Atlanta Braves and you're a kid from Georgia. And one thing we hate more than even maybe you and the St. Louis Cardinals is the Atlanta Braves. Like the Atlanta Braves <laughs> are our arch nemesis. And I remember seeing that trade go down and i was surprised like well, the freaking braves traded a georgia kid for freaking jd drew how did you take that as a georgia kid as a prospect when you're traded by the atlanta braves to the st louis cardinals well i mean uh you know i i um grew up a, the biggest braves fan in the history of the world Ugh, another reason i hate you. um i mean just like it couldn't be bigger you mm. know i I probably would have named my kid Shay if Chipper hadn't done it, you know, before I was drafted. Um, Very good. But uh, just like we patterned our days around those games, you know, like I know a lot of Mets fans do. But, you know, those 90s years with the Braves, you know, can I was really kind of growing up. Um, born in the 80s, you know, we 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 suffered through the the really hard times as Atlanta Braves fans, but I never took my Dale Murphy jer jersey off. Um, and then, but then, you know, the nineties were like this great reward when they traded for Smoltz and they got Glavin and Maddox in there and Maddox from the Cubs. And then, you know, they signed all these really cool veteran players. And I still remember, this is why I really love meeting fans out in the public. I remember meeting Lonnie Smith in the Atlanta mall when I was six years old, you know, mm. and he was, and he was just so cool to me. He was great to me. And I'll just never forget that. I remember I still, I'm 42 years old. Right. You know, I remember that now. And so I feel like those are special moments that you shouldn't botch. But, you know, up there, I don't know if y'all can scroll up enough, but at the top left there, uh, Brian Snickers bobblehead is up there. He was my double A <laughs> manager with wow. the Atlanta Braves wow. um, farm system. So 
But you know what? When I got traded away from the Braves, it was a good time for me to have a fresh start. I needed to kind of reset. I got sort of passed up by a few other prospects in the system, and and uh, I kind of had a bad reputation for, you know, maybe being lazy or being late. And so I, I wanted to reset that, and and uh, and that was a, a well earned reputation, by the way. Really. Um, and so uh, I needed to reset and trade, get a trade to the Cardinals. By the way, when I found out I was getting traded, I was uh, asking my future father-in-law for his permission to marry his daughter. And, oh you know, when God. you're when you're having that conversation and you're like, all right, sir, I'm, you know, I really want to settle down. And, you know, you know, everything's kind of on a path to, oh, it just got changed 180. So now we're going to St. Louis potentially. <laughs> so uh, that was in the middle of that conversation when I found out I was traded. I was very grateful uh, that I got traded to a great organization you know the winning franchise and looking at it now it's the greatest thing that ever happened in my baseball career no question about it now do you remember your major league debut i assume you do like i do a radio show with an athlete tiki barber you may have oh, yeah. a good decent football player and it's funny what he remembers and what he doesn't remember like there's certain things about his career he remembers specifically so it's always fascinating to hear that but your mlb debut do you remember specifically kind of everything about it because as yeah. you probably recall, it was against the New York Mets. It was. And um, and I remember there's several things I remember about it specifically, but um, I had two outs. I gave up a leadoff hit to a little Japanese second baseman guy. I can't remember his name. Um, I'll help you out. Kaz Matsui. Yeah, Kaz Matsui. I gave up a leadoff hit there and then ended up working my way around. I had two guys on. I had two guys out. Um, and I had a one-two count. Maybe a two-two count, but I think one-two count on Victor Diaz. That's right. And uh, Victor yeah. was a guy I faced in the minor leagues, you know, sixty-five times. Uh, we came up together against each other. I think maybe even drafted the same year. Maybe coming out of I think he came out of the Dominican. He might have been drafted a year or two before me, but we met up in the same, you know, rookie ball, A ball, you know, double A. We we faced each other that first day in the. But uh, the the thing about what I remember most about that was Victor never hit a home run off me, by the way. Never, not ever. You can ask him. The minor leagues never hit a home run off me. Um, had great success off Victor. He was the Mets' top prospect, and I was one of the Braves' top prospects. But I went four seams at the top, curveball. Never had a hit on me. Now, I mean, not never. he had some hits. Never had a home run. And then in the when I got to the Cardinals, I developed a slider. Uh, the Braves would never let me throw a slider. And I had a good one. And so I started throwing it. And I get to this count with Victor, and I went, he doesn't even know I have this slider. This is going to be devastating to him. He has no chance to hit this bit. And I threw it down and away just where I wanted to. And that son of a gun hit a 200-mile-an-hour line drive over the bullpen in left center for a three-run bomb. And the other thing I remember about that, the second thing I remember about that, uh, I remember almost every pitch I've ever thrown, if you can tell. I mean, um, I can tell right now. That's impressive, man. <laughs> um, but I, I remember that we were down by a few runs in that game, maybe three or four runs, and we put up a crooked number to get back to, to only losing by one run going into that inning. And so, like, you know, Tony La Russa was that kind of guy where he would war warm you up for, like, if you were, like, kind of the long guy or, like, the, you know, you pitched the kind of the, the not important innings. Um, he would warm you up to go in those innings. But if, but if you got back into the game, then he would put somebody else in. Well, and so that spot I'm, I'm there, I'm warming up and, and uh, we, we go, you know, one down and everybody's kind of looking over their shoulder, like, all right, who else is he going to get up? But he gave me a chance right there. He wanted to see what the young guy could do. And then I came in and quickly gave up a three run bomb. So then I didn't pitch for almost a month again. Yeah. That, by the way, that was a period of time where we all thought Victor Diaz was going to be a superstar. Like we were all convinced that guy's gonna be the next great Mets star. And unfortunately didn't exactly work out. Well, Victor was one of those guys that he had such a violent swing. Yeah. You know, it was like very much like Prince Fielder swing from the right side. He would, he would follow through and, and, and swing so hard that his bat hit the ground, like with a thud, you know, but he had major pop, a lot of potential. I'm not sure why that didn't work out. He was a great player. Yeah, no, we were confused too. So in 06, you're in the bullpen as a seventh and eighth inning guy, right? And then Jason Isringhausen gets hurt, and that's when you become the closer. At that point, are you thinking, I'm just a reliever, or were the Cardinals telling you, hey, look, eventually you're going to be a starter, but for now, this is what we need you to do? Man, I spent five and a half years in the minor leagues. Um, 
toiling my life away while watching all these guys in the big leagues. At that point in my career, what the only thing I was concerned with at all was being a big league baseball player, big league pitcher, never going back to the minor leagues. And so um, luckily I never did, you know, except for on rehab assignments, we were fortunate enough to stay up for a lot of years, but um, you know, that was the main goal. I, I told, I told Tony La Russa, I said, man, I'll, I'll do whatever you need. I will, I will fill up the Gatorade buckets, whatever mm -hmm. I need, but I, I got to go, you know, I got to go North. And so he made me earn it, but luckily we did. What, what it was in that 06 year. I don't know if you remember the 06 yeah. was really my first full season. I don't know if you saw that year. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm aware of that year. Oh. I, I, and you know what? I'll tell you this. We beat you and beat Jason Isringhausen on a game winning home run by Carlos Beltran. And as the series was starting against you bastards in 06, and I love Izzy. Izzy was a great Met, and he's a great pitcher. But because <laughs> as a fan, we had the memory of Beltron taking him deep, that memory was in my effing mind when you were closing out games, specifically in game seven, because my thought was, I know Carlos can hit him. I'm not sure about you because you were freaking unknown. Like, you're this kid who became the closer the last week of the season and you had a nasty curveball. That's all. I mean, I, as a baseball fan, that's all I knew about you. And that's dangerous. When you don't know much about a guy, you become dangerous. What were you thinking, by the way, as an, an, a closer getting this job with like days to go in the season that year? Yeah, I mean, it really was days to go. I, I think what what prepared me for that moment, I got to tell you a quick story. But um, also, I got to brag on my, my manager and pitching coach a little bit, Tony and Tony LaRusso and Dave Duncan did such a great job of bringing me along uh, slowly at, a, at appropriate times, pitching me in bigger moments when I earned them and when I was ready for it and brought me along to when I got to that spot, you know, I was ready for it. But also, uh, got to tell you this story. It takes five minutes. Um, hopefully that's all right. It's a five minute exactly story. You can time it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so when I was in the minor leagues, I was, I came up with the Braves, then get traded to the Cardinals, but it didn't matter. Every minor league year, I had very high ups, very low downs, very inconsistent player. Um, and just, uh, frustrating to, to live your life like that and to play like that. You know, I, I knew I had some potential, but it just wasn't, I wasn't figuring out a way to, to hone in on it and master it just yet. So, uh, really superstitious man, like, couldn't wear blue jeans, had to eat Papa John's pizza the night before I pitch. I love Papa John's pizza, but you know, if you have to do that the night before you pitch, then it, it's not a, it's not a strengthening tool. It's kind of a weakened tool because sometimes you go to these little minor league towns, you don't have Papa John's pizza. And right. so then I go into my start and I'm going, well, you know, I didn't get to eat what I know I, I pitch well with. So, you know, I'm probably screwed. You know, these kinds of things were going through my head, which is just ridiculous. And, um, and, uh, I got when I was uh, in double A with the Braves, I got um, a chance to go to play for the uh, 2003 Olympic qualifying team, Team USA. And and uh, I get there. I'm supposed to be like the number two pitcher. Dave Stewart's my pitching coach. Frank Robinson's my manager. And he says um, he sees my first bullpen session. Dave Stewart sees my first bullpen. And he goes, dude, that's man, you got some great stuff. This is going to be cool. Yeah, you're pitching game two. We're going down here. We're going to go to Panama. We're going to qu qualify, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, great, let's do this. So we're out in the fall, Arizona Fall League getting ready for this thing, and I pitched a couple of times and just got my absolute lunch handed to me each time. You know, it was terrible. And uh, and Dave Stewart called me in to the office or to the hotel room one day with Frank Robinson, and he said, man, we cannot take you with us on qualifying. You're just not ready. Mm. You're just not ready. You, you, your mind is in a bad spot. And until you learn how to believe in yourself, you're not going to make it. Well, then I get traded. And I found out I got traded because there was like six or seven or eight guys in a room, all the big guys from the brass, from the Braves. Uh, and seven of the eight said, dude, get this guy out of here, man. Get him for J.D. Drew. Yeah, send him. This guy's never going to make it. This, the, between the years is not right. there, man. You know, it's just not there. And so then uh, I go to the Cardinals, and that's that same year that we talked about uh, Victor hitting the home run off me. I'm the only one that got sent home from the playoff, uh, before the playoffs. All the other young guys, we only called up like three or four guys. They went on the trip. They went mm -hmm. to experience it. They went to get their, you know, 
to experience a playoff, see the crowds and feel the game and be there just in case, you know, to see somebody down there that can help. Not me. I got sent out and I went into the office and I didn't even know I was getting sent out. I wore a suit to the field and brought my bags ready to go. And uh, Jason Marquis pulled me aside and said, dude, I don't think you're going. Wow. I said, man, what? I got the stuff. Nobody told me. He said, go talk to Tony. I go to talk to Tony. Tony says, dude, it ain't going to work. You know, you got to get home. Get You got to get a lot better. Can't use you. Okay. So that off season for my off season, Cardinals are still playing. They're playing against the Astros. Pujols hits that dramatic home run off Brad yes. Lidge. Yeah. Uh, and I'm watching it and I should be excited. Right. But I'm, I'm just kind of, torn up about it so i i go outside i turn off the tv i go outside it's dark outside i get in this little john boat i have this little lake behind my house and little pond i just pedal out in there and i just start calling out i'm like god why am i going through all these struggles man why is it up and down and why is all these guys getting promotions and i'm getting sent out and i get traded because i'm not ready and like why is everybody wrong and like man why can't they see and like yeah, like Bobby Cox and these guys, they don't know what they're talking about. And Tony LaRusso doesn't know what he's talking about. And Dave Stewart doesn't know what he's talking about. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait a second. That's a lot of really Hall of Fame caliber people right there to not know what they're talking about. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Maybe it, maybe it actually was my fault. Maybe it mm. was my problem and not their problem. Maybe it wasn't what they weren't seeing. Maybe it was what I wasn't doing. And so right there on the spot, I looked up to God and I committed to him right there on the spot. I said, Lord, from now on, I am going to throw every pitch like it's the last pitch of the World Series. Every single rep in the gym like it's the last pitch of the World Series. Every practice throw like it's the last pitch of the World Series. Mm. I'm going to hit uh, this spot with such intent that it's the last pitch of the World Series. I'm going to make pitches like it's the last pitch of the World Series, and everything's going to matter that much, and I'm going to take this thing serious. I'm going to take my my craft serious, finally. And so I went, I did that every day, all offseason, all offseason long. I get into spring training, and I see Dave Duncan. And Dave, before I even threw the first pitch, says, you look different. And I said, mm. yes, sir. And he says, what's different? I said, just watch. So I throw my bullpen. Long story short, I pitched, I think I threw nine games that spring training. I struck out 14 guys, gave up two hits, made the team. Tony calls me in the office and says, how in the world did you do that? You were my last guy last year. We almost didn't invite you to big league camp. Like what was, I mean, what just happened? I said, I'll tell you after the season. He goes, keep that attitude. You're going north with us. I said, yes, sir. That season I started out as a long guy. I worked my way up pitching the sixth inning and I was pitching the seventh inning. And I was pitching the eighth inning. Izzy goes down. Right. I get a big opportunity. I finally step into that role. They brought me along slow. I pitched the ninth inning like one time only. Yeah. One time only against the right. Brewers at the very last couple of days of the season. And I threw three warm up pitches to get ready for that because Braden Looper was warming up and they pulled him off and they got me ready. And uh, gave me the first save up, my first real save up that season. But then I closed out the L NLDS and LCS in the World Series. And Tony calls me back in the office afterwards. This is a really long story. I'm condensing. He calls me back in the 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 uh, office afterwards, and he says, "All right, you told me you'd tell me. Now you got to tell me how did that happen?" And I said, "Tony, you don't understand." And I told him the story, and I said. I closed out the World Series all offseason. I closed out the World Series all spring training long. I closed out the World Series all season long, 62 times. And then I did it five, seven more times or whatever it was in the postseason, nine more mm. times, whatever it was. So by the time I get to close out the World Series, I'd already closed it out 73 times or whatever it was. So it was the old hat. Right. And the only thing he said was, he goes, I'll be damned. He goes, <laughs> he goes now all I got to decide is if you're a starting pitcher or a closing pitcher. Right. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to pitch the first nine or the ninth, nothing in between. And he said, that's fair. And then I've started ever since. I got to tell you, it's a very inspirational story. Like I, I'm inspired. And then a part of me remembers that that story led to such pain for us as Met fans, but <laughs> it shows how different things can be in such a short period of time. I mean, to your point, you're not even going 
to October in 05 and 06, you're closing out the divisional series against the Padres, obviously what you did to us, and then the World Series. Uh, it, it is incredible. Now, when you're the closer now and you beat the Padres the way you did, and now you're facing the Mets, we got this impression, basically because Braden Looper started singing it after you guys beat us, that you guys kind of mocked the Jose Reyes, Jose, Jose, Jose. You kind of thought it was dopey. Maybe you thought he was dopey. What's the deal? Did, were you guys like? Did you think that was pathetic? Did you think we were pathetic for singing it? Your thoughts? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't even remember doing that. Honestly, I, first of all, I love Jose. I think he's a he had a great career, and he was he was uh, always uh, very nice to me. I always felt like we had a great relationship from across the diamond. Um, but number seven was not an easy out, you know, and he he actually hit a really hard ball off me. Oh, I know. Line seven, drive line off the drive. bat. I couldn't believe Jim Edmonds cruised over to it, made it look so easy. Yeah, that yeah. that at bat in that inning, Wayno. Can I call you Wayno or should I call you a different name? Should I call you a curse word? What do you yeah, want to call, call me Wayno. Wayno. Dude, that ball off the bat, I thought, because I'm sitting behind home plate, I thought that was going up the alley. You must have been scared shitless when he hit that ball. No, because if you watched before the pitch, I went out to Jimmy and I said, hey, move about five feet that way. I just yes. stay right there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jimmy was great at that kind of positioning, though. You know, there was uh, – if you made your pitch in a location where you, you were trying to make him, he knew – right where to be and he had incredible first steps but uh that was all positioning right there man that was that was uh and, and that was a good pitch too he just went down and got it and hit a yeah. hard ball um but uh you know i think that was a, a uh the precursor to that was i struck out jose earlier in the series um on a curveball in the dirt and so you know when you get a guy swinging at your curveball in the dirt and then the next one you throw him is a little bit higher that looks like it's down the middle so even if it was a couple days away, the hitters remember that. Good hitters remember that kind of stuff. Well, here's one thing that I don't think enough Met fans remember. And obviously, just by talking to you for a few minutes, I certainly know you're going to remember it. Game five, in a lot of ways, is the most painful game of this series for me because the Mets gave Tom Glavin a lead. He gave up two runs immediately. You guys then scored a run, a run, a run. Before you know it, it's 4-2. And you got called in in the eighth inning with the Mets down by two, with the eyes on base, and Jose Valentin was up. And you gave us a preview none of us knew was coming because you struck him out on a curveball that I have to tell you, because I went back and watched this to remind myself, it was not a freaking strike. Like, you know that, right? It was off the plate. I mean, this is all, you know, we didn't have a box back then, but... <laughs> Oh, wow. I so mean, it's still, look, was it a ball or a strike? Be honest. Your guy, your guy, Tommy Glavin, did he ever throw a pitch on – did he ever throw a strike on the plate in his entire no. life? I mean, no. you know, no, the guy is getting – he's a master at getting this far off the plate. I would have loved to have had that strike zone. So don't give me that. But uh, I, I'll, I'll go back to a different at bat. I think yeah. one of the keys of the bat uh, – a key, key at bats of the series was first and second no outs in the bottom of the ninth. You had a pinch – uh, hitter up that was going to bunt and you pulled him back and you brought in cliff floyd yes you brought in cliff floyd and yes. um that was kind of your 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 manager randolph was going for right there he he thought there's got a young guy on the mound he's he's exposed he's out there shaking his you know knees together knocking his knees together and, and can't handle this moment cliff's about to hit a giant home run and uh and 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 watching that at bat back actually it gets me more nervous almost than the Beltran at bat because in the moment I'm not nervous, not at all. I get nervous now watching it back, but I threw him like five straight heaters inside over and over and over again, just challenging because, you know, you couldn't let Cliff get extended. If Cliff got extended, he was going to hit a ball 200 miles an hour. He had, he had that, he had those like some of the hardest line drives I've ever seen hit. He hit them. Yes. And uh, just a, just a monster of a guy in the, in the batter spot. But, um, you know, after I had him set up so hard in, uh, there was no way he could think anything else was coming. He had to get ready for 94 on his hands over and over again. And he just missed the first one. He just yep. missed it. If I don't get that in, if I don't get that in one more inch, he hits that 500 feet and then Randolph makes the greatest call ever. But, um, you know, then the 2-2 the two -two curveball, there's just no way. He couldn't look for it. Well, Okay, I'm so glad you brought this one up because this is one of those first second guesses in the history of the Mets. 
We get the first two guys on base, like you said. We're down by two after that Yachty home run, which is another moment. Yachty will be uh, another guy who joins me down the road on the killer series because that was a killer moment. Yeah. But I remember sitting there thinking, I want a bunt. And the guy to bunt was Tom Glavin because he was the best bunter on the team. But how would you have reacted? Because it would have been so obvious if Tom Glavin is sent up as a pinch hitter to lay down a bunt. Like, we all know what's going on. Like, their other option was Anderson Hernandez, but Glavin was literally their best punter. Yeah. So, if Glavin comes up there with two on and nobody out, and you know he's bunting, like, I don't know. I, how would you have faced him? Let me tell you something. No one watched him lay down more bunts than I did, than I did growing right. up. I mean, that guy was a master bunter. He was a very, very good bunter. All those Braves guys were great bunters. That was a big part of their deal. But he was great at it. I do think it would have been very hard to bunt some of my off-speed stuff in those days. But if anyone could have done it, it would have been him. I imagine we would have had some kind of wheel play on. Right. Um, so that, you know, thinking that Glavin's up there, you still take your chances, I think, even if he knows you're crashing, that he's not going to pull back and swing and hit a ground ball or line drive through a hole somewhere. Uh, he had great back control, but you still like your chances in that moment to put a wheel play on, I would think. But – Hey, it didn't happen. You did, you put in clip. You know, I, there's you know this is all ifs and buts. Uh, you know, and when he came up, my biggest fear was a double play because he couldn't move. Like he had, I think it was knee issues at the time. So my fear was, boy, he hits the ball on the ground. It's a freaking double play. Innings over. Either hit a home run or strike out. Because at least if you strike out, like the inning still sort of continues. Yeah. What what would you have wanted then? Like as you're on the mound. Two run lead, two outs, or two on, nobody out. Would you have preferred the Mets send up an obvious punter, or was it better to face a guy like Cliff Wood, who you know is just trying to go for the downs? No, I mean, I think it, you know, I don't know. In that moment, it, it didn't matter to me. I was just overly cocky. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the first two guys reached, I'll tell you this, the first time I ever heard a thing from the crowd all year was those first two batters and the whole crowd was going nuts. And your former Met hand, uh, Jason Isringhauser Hausen, um, taught me a lesson earlier that year in spring training. He said in the, in the biggest spots this year, you're going to get in some big spots in the biggest spots when the game feels like it's running away from you and it's speeding up and you got to slow it down. You need to step off the rubber. You can take a couple of deep breaths and you just need to reset and if you do that, the game will slow down, trust me. And I did that in that moment. I remembered that, and I did it in that moment. And I told you, every mother effer that I was hearing from the stands that was raining down on me, yeah, um, I didn't hear them anymore. It was like clearing the mechanism or whatever that uh, was in that movie. So um, that really got me through that moment. I don't think I would have cared who was coming up. Um, I, in my mind, from that second on, we were getting whoever it was out, you know, but I'd certainly think that in that spot, you know, especially with the swings he ended up taking, Cliff was probably the right call there. Well, Cliff strikes out. Reyes hits that line drive we talked about earlier. You walked LaDuca. You weren't pitching around LaDuca, right? Like you weren't cockily trying to go up the Beltron, right? No, and you look at that pitch. If that's off the plate, it's like a half a centimeter off the plate. It was mean, close, you could have yeah. very easily rung him there on a 3-2 pitch. It was a fastball sinker down the way. I thought I made a great pitch. And uh, if it's off the plate, it's – you know, I think that's one of those – if we had the, 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 the box now, that would have been like part of the ball was on the box and the right. other – you know, part of it's off the box. If we had the but, box, you wouldn't have struck out Valentin in game five, if we're being fair. I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, your box. My box is a little bigger than your box. So. <laughs> right. Um, so is it the Tommy Glavin box? Because I will give you that. Glavin had a giant yeah. box, man. Yeah, That's exactly. Sure. But, you know, the, here, here's where here's where uh, some Mets fans don't know what happened. Um, when Beltran comes to the plate, we got bases loaded. Two outs, and yeah. I'm doing this because you you got to force out at any base, obviously. So it's the smart play statistically to wad Valens in there, right? I'm just teasing. <laughs> um, so uh, Beltran comes up to bat. Yachty comes out to talk to me, and this is why I hate the pitch clock in these big moments. Just in the big moments, now I know right. I understand you know regular season stuff. It's it's important and whatever, but I feel kind of like they. I wish they kind of get rid of it in in some of the spots. I know you can't do that, but. Uh, this moment was so key for the whole series. You know, I wish you could call time or something three times a game and just have more extended time, something. But Yachty comes out to talk to me. And uh, he says, um, 
hey, what, what are you thinking here? I'm thinking sinker down the way. He's going to be aggressive. He's going to be swinging first pitch. So we got to make this pitch down the way. I said, great. He gets back behind home plate and he looks up at Carlos and then he looks out at me and he goes, hey, stay with me right here. We had a kind of a sign for that. And uh, I just had such incredible faith in Yachty mm. um, that whatever he was about to do would make sense. And I thought he was going to put curveball down, but he put change up down. And in the moment, I thought, wow, that's brilliant. He'll never expect that. And I had enough moxie to throw it. Now, when I watch back, I'm like, don't throw a change up. If, <laughs> you know, this is your fourth best pitch. What are you doing? But uh, if you look at the pitch, it looks like a meatball right down the middle. But that changeup actually started at him and worked back to the middle of the plate. But it started at him, and it was slower. So usually if it starts at you, you're going to have a hair trigger like, all right, I'm swinging. But it, when it was slower, you could see his eyes kind of light up. And he steps out, and his eyes got really big. And I knew right there I knew he had him. I knew yeah. Yachty. I knew Yachty outsmarted him right there. But his eyes got really big, and he was like, what the heck was that? Because you know he was thinking, all right, this is going to be a fastball. This is going to be a curveball. Right. He might throw a cutter slider thing in on my hands, but probably going to be hard or slow. And then I throw this change up. The last thing he expected, that kind of, I really feel like that might have got him kind of out of whack a little bit. No, it certainly worked. And obviously there's a curveball that lives in infamy when you were ahead 0-2. And you, you were confident. Like you knew when you threw the 0-2 curveball, did you know I'm going to fool him so badly he's not even going to swing? Well, what we knew was, and Yachty, talked in, Yachty and I talked about it before the game, we've been watching his at-bats all series and, and all postseason, really. And, and Carlos was very aggressive early in the count. So 0 0 one swinging all the time, taking his rips, and, and, and hitting pretty good, right? Like I think he was coming into that series, he was hitting like 500 in the postseason. And almost that in his career postseason. I mean, yeah, the guy was, great postseason he was a play. cardinal killer, yep. you know, in the postseason leading up to that moment. Yep. So, um, well, we've been watching him. After those two pitches, though, very patient. O two 2 counts a lot. We had him O two 2 a lot. But then it would be 1-2, two, 2-2, two, two, three, two, every time. And then somebody would throw something up there and he'd hook it in the corner, run to second, and, or hit a home run or whatever it was. So I look at Yachty and I said, man, are you thinking what I'm thinking here? If we get this guy 0-2, what are you thinking? I said, I I'm thinking he's going to take this pitch if we throw it 0-2. And mm -hmm. he says, I, th I think he will too. And so I said, man, 0-2, I'm going to throw the best strike that I can possibly throw located, but strike, and we're going to take our chances. And, I mean, you know, that's, that's part of the reason it worked is that I had 100% belief in it. But it's kind of cra crazy mindset now. You know, my pitching coach this last year, Dusty Blake, would have punched me in the head if I had that kind of comment before the game. <laughs> right. But, you know, that's the, this is the key. This is When I tell young pitchers about watching film and, and really learning the hitters and preparing, this is one of the stories I tell because, you know, without watching and paying attention, we don't know that. Right. You know, we don't make that pitch. I probably bounced one there. He doesn't swing. Right. Now we got one, two. Then we go, all right, do we go back to curveball or do we go fastball, which is what he wants? Great fastball hitter. So I'm thinking, well, shoot, you know, because uh, we didn't get there because we paid attention. We prepared and luckily I executed a pitch. You sure did. Now we didn't see you for a while after that because you would just never face you, like for whatever reason. Yeah. A few years later, Beltron gets traded by us to the Giants, then as a free agent signs with the Cardinals. And I know that was the year you had the Tommy John, but you were there. I mean, you were around. Did you ever talk trash to Carlos? Did you ever no, say, Carlos, hey, what's up, Carlos? Carlos, was, that Carlos came to us in 2012. That was after us. So I was back pitching. Um, so Carlos was with us 2012 and 2013. Gotcha. And, gotcha. Uh, yeah. So that when, I, when I found out we had signed Carlos, first of all, Super excited, great player, great playoff player, uh, winning player, smart player, uh, great teammate. Everything that we'd always heard was actually true. This guy's an amazing person, by the way. Amazing person, uh, amazing wife, amazing family. Like when you watch Carlos and you watch his wife, you feel like they're the president and, the, and like the first lady. They're so right. professional. Like she's always dressed to the nine. 
and he's always dressed to the nines. Like they, they're always the best looking people in the room and they're the most like smooth person in the room. Like the way he walks and the way he dances is all like, just like really just super cool. So, um, I was excited. I called him and I think I was one of the first people to call him. And, uh, I said, Hey, listen, let's get this out. Everyone's going to ask us about it. Everyone's going to ask me what I'm saying about it. I said, Carlos, how do you want to handle this out of respect for you being the veteran player that you are and great player and new teammate? I'd, I'd love to respect you here and, and say, how do you want to handle it? However you want to handle it is how we're going to handle it. And he said, you know what, brother, that was a great moment for you. That was not so great for me. Let's leave it in the past. Never talked about it again. Wow. I think Carlos gets too much crap for that moment from Met fans because Carlos Beltran was a great Met. I'd be the first to tell you, but there are Met fans that don't appreciate him. And I think, unfortunately, they don't appreciate him because of one at bat. Yeah. And look, to your credit, as much as I begrudgingly say it, you made a freaking good pitch and you struck a guy out. And it seems like that has stuck with Carlos for a lot of Met fans. And it, it's just unfair. I'm just, I don't know if you know that it's the way Met fans have yeah. kind of treated him over the years, but it has been very unfair. Yeah. And, and, and Carlos, like you said earlier, hadn't faced me a whole lot. You know, he had very had, I don't even know if he had it bad off me um, before that series. And so, I mean, there wasn't a lot of familiarity there. Uh, it was kind of based off scouting reports and the scouting reports back in the day were not like they are now, you know, now, you know, what color the guy was his favorite color in fifth grade, you know? Right. Um, but uh, I, I think that that also played into to it with me, but um, you know what? I'm very grateful that that worked out because if I think if I don't get out of that situation, if Cliff pops one on me or Carlos takes me deep, probably Tony trades me to the Toronto Blue Jays and they trade me to the, you know, Oakland Athletics and I'm out oh, of the geez. game in two years. Yeah, well, <laughs> you would want that. It's funny. You are also a part of one of the great moments in Met history because you were the starter against Johan in that glorious no-hitter. I get a lot of shit from people that it wasn't really a no-hitter because of the missed call on the Beltron line drive. I'm just asking you, real no-hitter, not real no-hitter. You tell me. Well, this is like your argument earlier. I mean, it was a real no-hitter, you know, because that's what it ended up. It doesn't matter what it could have been if the – call had been made different the call wasn't made different so um it was a no hitter i had so much respect for for johan and what what um what was crazy about that day through three innings you you can go back and check this but i i'm pretty i'm right around the right area i think i had 34 pitches and i think he had 63 pitches uh through three innings yeah, well, that so the Johan part I definitely remember because he was laboring, and that's why most oh, yeah. of us didn't even realize he had a no hitter because he was walking guys, he was throwing a lot of pitches. It was not, it was yeah. not as clean as you'd think. No, 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 and and uh, and and when you're the the opposing pitcher, and especially I was feeling you know pretty good in those days. Um, you start like tasting that, like, oh yeah, this guy's almost done. I've got this, mm. you know, great pitcher on the ropes and. And uh, you kind of get that little salivating feeling like I'm about to beat this guy, you know. And, and uh, man, he just kept throwing punches. Didn't matter how many he threw. I think he threw, what, 168 pitches or something? <laughs> it was and, close. Uh, huh? It, it wasn't quite 168, but it was a lot, man. He, 158 then, 150-something. Yeah, he, he threw – and I think there's this fear. I don't know if this is true. You better know better as a pitcher that it ruined his career. And I – well. I don't buy it. Do you buy that? That that no, kind of no, performance no, no. ruined it? I, I don't think he had much longer. You you can ask him. I, I would never asked him, but I, I don't think there was much left there. I mean, it, it's he was in a better spot than than I was this year. But I can tell you at any time during the season, I told my manager, Ali Marmal, I said, listen, I'm too old to come out with a no-hitter. I don't care if right. I got 465 pitches. I'm too old to come out. If that's the last way you go, that's a great way to go. You that's know? a good way to go. And yeah. uh, and and I think Johan probably was in the same kind of mindset, but also an old school mindset. You know, you're not thinking about coming out ever, no matter what the score is or what how you're feeling. You you battle. You find a way to finish the, the job until they you know snatch the ball from you. But especially in a no hitter game, that's why you see like. 
you know, I think there was – who was it this year that had a no-hitter through seven and got taken out with, like, 80 pitches? I can't remember who it was. Might it have seems been, like uh, it's happened a lot the last couple of years. I know what happened with Kershaw recently, too, and when he was coming might, off an injury. It might have been him, actually, uh, now that I think about it. But um, you, you get a lot of texts – or tweets, I mean, saying, like, you know, I can't believe that I would have never done that when I was – and that's kind of true that back in the day you would – it would – like, the manager wouldn't even – ask you either he was you were just in you know but um you know i i think now with reports and what what this the the slug is and the the ops after the third time or after the second time through and that I mean pitchers you know have a tendency to struggle more that third time through sometimes but but the thing about that is and i'll argue this to the grave every day is different from the last mm. day every single day is different than the last day uh you can never judge one pitcher the same way 32 times you know you just can't do it there's there's gonna be a couple of days where he's having a day where he just needs the ball just give it to him i don't care what that sheet says i know but my eyes are telling me this dude's got it today mm -hmm. and and managers need to be able to um to act on that instinct. They do, you know, I think it gets robotic. You, the game is not supposed to be so robotic. It's a rhythm. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a dance, you know, it's just, it's supposed to be fun and it's supposed to be, you know, a, a, a challenge for a manager to go, all right, what well, man, what would I do here? And I, and I, and I do think there's a great place for analytics and, the, and all the information. There's also a great place for instincts and there's yeah. some great baseball instincts in these managers and coaches that uh, I wish would use them a little bit more, but that's my soapbox right now. But um, I do, I do think there's a, that the, I'm loving the information that there's a, here's, here's what we could do. Here's what you probably should do. Right. But is he having a day? That's what yeah. I need to know. No, I'm with you. I, I assume just following your career, because I, I actually, I should admit, I begrudging you, begrudgingly started to like you as a player as time went by. May have had you on my fantasy team a few times. But the thing I actually did like about you is that I'm old school. I want the pitchers to hit. And I want the pitchers to work at hitting. I want the pitchers to not just say, oh, I suck. Yeah. I guess I'll swing and miss a few times. Yeah. And I remember hearing stories about you taking it seriously and taking the Cardinal pitchers and saying, dude, this is serious. Like we got to hit, we got to yeah. help ourselves out. Do you miss the fact that major league baseball decided, screw it. Let's just get lazy and have the universal designated hitter. I do. I, I miss it, but I get it at the same time. Um, pitchers stopped uh, two things. Pitchers stopped being given the opportunity to work on it as much. Right. Um, it became much less of a priority uh, in the older days, you hit every day. Pitchers hit every day. They hit on the field. They stood out there and shagged for the other pitchers in spring training. Every day we hit. From the first day of spring on, you hit. You know, you bunted. You got the bunts down with velocity. You got the bunts down with spin. You hit on velocity. You hit on spin. You you worked on hitting the ball the other way. You worked on hitting runs. You worked on you know pull back and slugs and and then over time. Uh, pitchers stopped um, getting those opportunities as much. They also stopped hitting, uh, taking it seriously as much. Kids, if you take it back even farther, kids started being POs in high school, pitcher only. I, this was a thing I didn't even know was a thing until a couple of years ago. I went out to a high school practice and I, they're like, I'm like, what is that group of people over there doing? They're not even doing anything. And you're like, oh, those are POs. And I said, what is a PO? Oh, pitcher only. Uh. Pitcher only. <laughs> In high school, yeah, let the guy swing. You never know. Is that Shohei Otani might be? You never know, right? Yeah. So, um, there's been guys, there's been guys, there's been, um, what's his name from uh, he was started off with us and went to Arizona, played right field for a long time in Arizona. Great player, man. He he would have never got the opportunity if he would have just been a PO. He, all of a sudden, he was a pitcher with us, and all of a sudden, he's playing right field in Arizona. So, Peralta. So, um, I'm just thinking, you know. Let the guys be athletes, but uh, pitchers stopped taking it seriously. You know, it wasn't as yeah. big a deal to so the pitcher. Pitchers started, you know, I blew my Achilles out. I was the first one to say after I blew my Achilles out, do not get rid of the pitcher hitting. Do not get the DH because of this moment. It happens. People get hurt. I would have done the same thing probably walking upstairs. Who knows? Right. Amen, so, man. Amen.
Yeah. So, um, man, I just, I, I miss it, but I also get it because pitcher at bats started going way downhill. No question. Do you have a parting message for us as Met fans? Maybe an apology, you know, maybe a, hey, sorry about that. Anything you'd like to tell all of us? Well, I will say, you know, I appreciate uh, the time to share with a lot of the Mets fans. I love New York City to visit and eat food. Some of the best food, the best pizza. No one can ever tell me that's not the best pizza. That's the Thank best you. pizza. Um, great steakhouses. You know, great. It's fun to get on the subway and, and hang out with folk that you wouldn't normally hang out with. You know, it's fun. I like to do that. I like meeting new people. Um, from a small town in Georgia. So sometimes I do like to leave and go back, but um, I love going up there. I, I love my time in New York. You know, you told me you were going to do a 30 minute thing with me. We did almost an hour. So I feel like you kind of shoved it up my rear in a little <laughs> bit too. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I feel like this, you know, it's a little give and take here, but um, it was cool talking with you. I've loved my time playing against the Mets. You know, it was, it was fun. They whooped me a few times. I whooped them a few times. It was a good match. But I love one of my favorite moments ever was getting booed during the All-Star game in New York. I love oh, yeah. Great. Yep. We were that booing you very loudly. Well, just remember this, and I think you already know this. You will live in Met history forever. My grandkids will know about you. My kids already know about you. They hate you. You will live forever. So congratulations on that, because not a lot of people get to do that, and you accomplished it. And so, and also, in all seriousness, congrats on a great career. Uh, congratulations on the Thank Fox you. job. You'll do a fine, fine job. And we do appreciate you joining us as the inaugural member of the Killer Series. Because who better to talk to than the guy that shoved it up our ass in 2006? So, Adam, thank you. I think I got that ball sitting over here somewhere. Do you really? You got the ball that struck out Beltron? Time out. Let me get this ball for you real quick. Oh, get this ball. He's getting a freaking ball. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, at least uh, somebody didn't, like, take it and steal it and try to sell it like Doug Mankiewicz did for the Red Sox in 2004. So I guess if anyone has the ball, I I'm glad you have it and not somebody else. And it wasn't flipped up into the stands because we would have burned it. Or we would not burned it. We would have destroyed it. We would have uh, spattered it into a million pieces. But he's got the ball. That, just, that tells you everything you need to know. That this moment that causes us such great pain Causes this man such happiness. And why not? A freaking rookie. He's closing out the NLCS and eventually winning the World Series. So. Yeah, yeah I got it. All right. Here oh, there it is. I like that. He's got it. The ball. How many balls do you have, by the way? Do you save, like, a lot of balls from your career? Yeah, I got a few balls, man. You got a few. Hmm. Let's see here. Let me just take you over here. <laughs> Let me just take you over here. All right. I apologize for the mess because – uh you know, you get I'm I'm finally home full time, so it's kind of a mess, but got lots of cool balls. Oh my god, you got a lot of balls there, man. People said that to me a lot in my life. Um <laughs> uh, some cool awards, but um, you know, this uh let's see here, here's NLDS, and it was Mets nine to six save NLCS game five. NLCS game seven. five. Here it was right there. Look at that. That's NLCS Look at that. Five right there. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, very nice. That's so, that's some collection you got there. That's great. That's freaking mm. great. That's fantastic. Usually I know right where my game seven ball is. Well, it's in here. You know what yeah. I mean? No, I believe you. Yachty, Yachty yeah. let me have that one. He uh he didn't let me have the the uh the World Series winner. I wonder if Yachty got the home run ball. I mean, the freaking guy at the home run off Aaron Hammond in the ninth inning into the bullpen. I wonder if he ended up getting that because I almost caught who that else ball. would have gotten that? I almost caught that ball. All right. Well, hey, look. really, really, I want to try to stay. I like to try to stay married. I got a show. I got to go watch with my wife. So no, you. Hey, listen, me too. You got it. Thank you, man. I really appreciate the time. Thank you very much.